Here we are. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Between the Sheets with Leah. I am your host. I am a money-making, um, action-taking, God-fearing, manifesting queen. Yes. And we are here on Between the Sheets. I have a special guest, Miss, okay, now G. Like, I, I could say G because I asked you about Gabby last time. You're like, eh. No, no Gabby. <laughs> introduce yourself. Introduce yourself. Gabrielle Simmons. Um, I am also a money-making queen. Yeah, um, yeah. In the real estate space, trucking space, doing all kinds of different things. So thank you for having me here yes, today. Yes, thank you for being here because um, first and foremost, I think what we're about to get into and what you do is kind of a, and I may sound naive, but a under, either undervalued or under, um, not known. Yeah, it, yeah. It, I think the industry is just not as well known or people don't have as much knowledge, whether they don't search it out or it's just not as big. So I'm really excited to kind of dive into all of this. Um, I think that this podcast is really going to be important for anybody that is interested in any type of diversification in your portfolio, um, real estate investing. And um, we have one of Colorado's most professional and most knowledgeable in the house. And so I'm very excited to kind of just jump right in. Um, Gabby, I want to ask you first and foremost, if you don't don't mind. How old are you? 29. I keep saying 28 because I just turned 29. 29 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at 29 years old, I had just had my third son. I was two years out. I was two years out from having him. And I, you know, I remember looking at, I still look at this picture of me when I'm 30 years old and I'm like, who is that woman? I don't mm -hmm. really recognize her. How is it? And, and where did you start getting into this whole scheme of things? The age of, and probably even earlier, because if you're 29 now, how long have you been doing this? Uh, three and a half, almost four years. Okay. So what led you into this whole, um, I guess, road of, of wholesaling and in, in, in this industry? Um, I, I actually started as a business owner when I was 22. No, 23 is when I started my first company. Um, actually, that's not true. I started my very first company when I was 18. It was a cleaning company. Yeah. I did all the things, all the like business cards and flyers and little newspaper ads. And things. you were a business. <laughs> yeah. And I was a business and I was a business owner and I cleaned one house and I was like, yep, nope, I can't do this. this not not for, me. for me. Not for me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so my second business was um, truck driving. Uh, so when I was 22, I was like, I'm done being the office job lady, like, I, I had a lot of issues with like always being the youngest person surrounded by people who were older than me, but I was doing the same job they were. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I decided to quit my job and go become a truck driver when I was 22. Um, and then nine months later went and bought my own truck. That's when I started my first business. Wow. Um, also with that came making a crap ton of money. That, with the like, truck driving. Yeah. Yeah, I hear that often. I have a couple of friends um, who just uh, came off from getting their CDLs, and they, they were like, we have this whole thing. We're going to be gone for really long periods mm -hmm. of time, but we're going to make a shitload of money. Yes. So. And um, I don't come from money. I no. don't come from um, financially educated family as a whole. So I just started, like, blowing it. I was taking trips to Dubai, and flying out friends to come to Cuba with 22 just... years old. <laughs> yeah. This is what's still just like so <laughs> mind blowing to me. 22 years old. My, my son is 22 years old and like, he doesn't know what the hell he's doing with his life right now. <laughs> no offense, Jojo. <laughs> well, and most, most young kids don't like, yeah. um, did you just grow up ahead of your time? I mean, did you have to grow up fast? Yeah. Yeah. Like looking back in my childhood, I, I, didn't have much of a childhood. I had to grow up super quick um, and take care of those around me. Mm -hmm. So um, I quickly realized that like I got me and that's it. Yeah. And so um, I always, I've always had a taste for nice things like mm -hmm. most of us ladies do. Yeah. And I, I knew that um, to get those things and to travel and have the life I wanted, I had to go after it. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. Um, I just always made it a point to do so. So trucking, I just, the 22 year old young lady mm -hmm. decided I'm going to go <laughs> be a trucker. Yeah. And 
drive all over the country by myself like a by yourself chick. that's scary yeah. like you see all these shows of like stuff that happens I mean mm-hmm. did you ever encounter any of that stuff um I did have a couple run-ins with like creepers you know yeah. that like tried to follow me into truck stops and like ba- knocking on my door in the middle of the night and Ugh. like really creepy things but I also stay strapped so Good. I was just like you guys can mess with me if you want to um which is illegal by the way for it's truckers illegal? we're not al- illegal we're not allowed to. Did you just say that? And yeah, like I don't it. give a damn. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because my my philosophy was always like, um, you know, better safe than sorry. Yeah. And I'm a yeah. woman out here by myself. Yeah. It's illegal for truckers to carry a, a weapon across state lines because different, different states yep. have different laws. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I d- didn't care. So yeah, it's better to protect yourself and have that and deal mm-hmm. with the consequences later. Yeah. 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 Um, so how long you, you did you do this before you jumped into wholesaling? Uh, about a year and a half okay. of trucking full time, making great money, realizing that I need something to do with this money that isn't going to be just spending it on trips. Mm. Um, so I started with Bigger Pockets, uh, biggerpockets.com. They have a podcast, they have books, they have videos on YouTube, they have all the things. Mm-hmm. Um, highly recommend bigger pockets so while I was driving I would just listen to their podcasts and videos and um, books audiobooks and so I I kind of taught myself through those sources Mm -hmm. um, wholesaling because I initially wanted to buy rental properties and quickly realized like yeah you're making a lot of money but you're not making that much money to just Mm -hmm. go buy properties or have 20 percent or 10 percent down payments um to go get bank loans mm-hmm. to buy properties. Yeah. Uh, so I learned about this other strategy called wholesaling. And it is a very not known strategy, even amongst real estate agents, uh, uh, mortgage brokers, like people who are in the real estate business, a lot of them don't even know what wholesaling is yeah. or how it works. Mm-hmm. Um and, and that's that's one of my I, I guess one of my things that I have written down is because we're gonna have listeners who are probably very very new to this concept because mm-hmm. again it's just not widely known. Um, just give us an explanation of what it is and how it differs from real estate mm-hmm. investing or 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 um, real estate strategies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so wholesaling is being the middleman. Okay, so as a wholesaler, I'm going to go to a seller and I get in touch with sellers, owners of properties before they're contacting a realtor. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very key. And is that typically because it is going to be a home that is in foreclosure or they can't like pay or because what would stop somebody from saying, oh, hey, I want to use a wholesaler rather than a real estate agent? Mm -hmm. The reason why people would rather work with a wholesaler than a real estate agent is uh, because they're in pre-foreclosure. That's Mm -hmm. a good example. Uh, Usually it's some kind of distress. So something that means that they need to sell their home fast. Because if you hire a realtor to sell your home, they're going to just take pictures and put your house on the market and hope somebody comes to buy it. Yeah. As a wholesaler, I'm saying we are going to buy it, mm-hmm. like right now. Like when I set the date of the closing, that's when we're going to actually buy mm. it. You're not waiting for someone to come along and say that they want to buy it. Okay. Um, so yes, any type of distress, or maybe they're embarrassed. You know that that's a very common thing I've seen too, mm. especially hoarders. Just homes. bought a home, maybe just bought a home too, and uh-huh. like especially in an industry like we're in right now, or the economy that we're in right now with these high interest rates thinking that we can handle it. And then now we can't make the mortgage payment. That can yeah. be embarrassing as well. Absolutely. Um, Hoarders, also you said. we have a lot of military around us. So if they bought a house in the last two years and now they're moving, they are upside down. Mm. They don't have any equity. They don't have the ability to sell their house and actually that make is, money. That's such a crazy concept to me that being upside down in a house, it is still re- like, it's, it's still prevalent. Like it's oh, still, yeah. you know, cause more you, now than ever. You hear, exactly. Well, other than like 2008. Correct. Yeah. Because you always hear you're safe. Real estate is safe, 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 safe. And then you have something like 2007, 2008 that hits and you're like, oh, okay, it's not so safe. You know, and then you do well, 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 well. And then again, so, I mean, overall it is, it, it is very safe strategy, but there are things like are happening right now mm-hmm. where people are upside down because they got into something that they couldn't afford. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. So we as wholesalers, we act as investors. Um, 
basically I'm the middleman between the seller of a home and a cash investor. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I do not have hundreds of thousands of dollars cash, Mm -hmm. but my partners, my investors do. And where are you finding these investors? How, How did you find somebody that's willing to get to know you and be like, okay, I trust you and I'm going to invest in something. Mm -hmm. Um, When I started, I did not have the investor. So I got the deal first. I got the property locked in and I was able, I knew how to run my numbers. That's Mm -hmm. a very key thing to do. And it's, again, it's very different than how a real estate agent is going to analyze the value of a property, Mm -hmm. how we as wholesalers or investors analyze the value of a property is completely different. Mm -hmm. Um, So I learned how to run the numbers. I got my first deal under contract and I did not have a buyer yet. I did not have an investor. So I posted it to Facebook. So you bought the property yourself? No. No. How do you close on a property with no money? Uh, that's, That's the beauty of it. So I signed a contract with the seller that says, Gabrielle Simmons and or assigns there's specific verbiage in my contract again Mm -hmm. it's a different contract than what a real estate agent uses Mm -hmm. Um, in some cases I do use the normal realtor contracts but typically I'm using a very straightforward one page contract Mm -hmm. and it states that I'm allowed to assign this (coughs) contract over to someone else so my agreement with the seller states I'm going to buy the house for, say, $200,000. Mm-hmm. Me or whoever I assign this contract to. By it's a gonna, given date? By a given date, yep. And then I find an investor. If I don't already have one lined up, I post it to Facebook and say, hey, here's this great deal, guys, who wants it? Mm-hmm. And an investor would approach me and say, yep, these numbers look like they make some sense. I would like to buy this. Mm-hmm. So then there's a second contract that just states that I'm assigning – contract A over to the investor Mm -hmm. and the investor is going to pay $220,000. So at closing, I don't even have to go to closing. And this is why I started doing this while I was still truck driving. Mm -hmm. I'm like in freaking Nebraska and I had a closing here in Colorado. I didn't have to be here and they go to closing and then I just get paid the difference. So the seller gets their 200,000 and the buyer bought it for 220,000 so I make the 20000 in between. And then they can, their their profit comes when they resell or flip it or After do whatever they, they decide that they're going to do, which a lot of the times it is a flipping property because it may not be in the best mm-hmm. condition. Yeah, a lot of times, uh, except for those like uh, what I mentioned, if you're upside down, people who bought in the last two years, usually their houses are nice, if not new builds. And so in those cases, uh, we get into creative financing where I'm actually buying the house subject to the existing mortgage. That's a whole other thing. Wow. Um, <laughs> so where did, okay, so let, let me back up then really quick, because when I think of wholesaling, when I think of the word wholesale mm-hmm. as just somebody who sells lingerie or, you know, I think of buying stuff in bulk yep. and reselling it at a higher value. Yep. Essentially, it's the same thing. And that is also why it's different. Wholesaling is different in the part of strategy as far as real estate, because real estate, you're adding in the fees. You're selling the property at the property value or higher Mm -hmm. in today's market, possibly, or or yesterday's market, I should say. (laughs) Um, And this one, you're kind of like, this is a killer deal that typically you're walking away with because of the distress. Yep, Mm -hmm. exactly. So where then, you you got your first deal, you posted on Facebook because you didn't have an investor who said, okay, I'm willing to to take on this, I don't know if you want to call it a a risk because the other thing that I would say is that um, I've heard that it is one of the least riskiest investments that you can do. Uh, Wholesaling? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. It's super not risky for me. Now, the investor who's buying, they're flipping the house, Yeah, which is why I'm not a flipper. I've never been a flipper because that is a different level of risk. Mm -hmm. Also, you're tied into it for a longer period of time, Uh, you know, putting in the time and money to renovate the property before you can sell it and actually see your profits. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have never been interested in being a flipper because of that higher level of risk. As a wholesaler, I get in, I get out. It's very clean. It's very cut and dry. I put no money in, literally zero dollars to make 20 grand, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that's something that you can just keep doing over and over again. So um, on that first deal, I actually had another wholesaler come to me and say, hey, I have a buyer for this. If we can split the profit, 
then I'll bring my buyer, he'll buy it, and we can do this deal together. Yeah, which is still a crazy win for you. Yeah. I mean, for putting something together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. So um, I'm sure that ahead of all of this, you started to um, basically implant yourself into groups and like um, chats or like places that other, you knew that there was possibly investors or, or maybe real estate agents, maybe just kind of a plethora of people. Mm-hmm. Um, And I actually have used like very different strategies as a wholesaler Mm -hmm. that are even different from what most wholesalers do Mm -hmm. being, I do connect with a lot of realtors. Um, Typically realtors see investors and wholesalers as their competition Mm. because we can buy and sell houses without them. Yeah. Cause you don't need a a license to be a wholesaler. No, you don't really need anything. No, And we don't need to hire a realtor. No one ever needs to hire a realtor, Mm -hmm. which is a common misconception. People think, Oh, I need to sell my house. I need to hire a realtor. No, you want to hire a realtor. You don't have to, um, you can buy and sell any piece of property without a realtor. So they look at us like we're trying to take business away from them. Um, I have utilized this as an opportunity to create, uh, more of a mutually beneficial relationship between wholesalers, specifically myself and all of the realtors in the city, um, by educating them one on what wholesaling is and how it works Mm -hmm. and how we can work together. And I can still pay them. I can still hire them to be a part of the transaction if they're bringing me these opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, so that that's really been a, a big way for me to like expand my business really quickly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What, okay, so when you talked about, um, you know, you knew that you liked the finer things in life and that you were like, okay, like if, I, if I'm going to go this route, then I, you know, I, if I want these things that I need to do something and you kind of saw that, what brought you down that path though? Like you, you said that you just started listening to podcasts, but what made you think, oh, wholesaling, like where, where did that concept come from for you? Um, it was from a podcast. Okay. It definitely. Because it just initially. Came up and then you're like interested, intrigued. Yeah. Cause initially I'm like, okay, I have a bunch of money. What do, what do rich people do with money? They invest. What do they invest in? Stocks or real estate right. typically. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started looking into real estate as a whole. Then I started looking into rental properties mm-hmm. and then I'm like, well, damn, if I don't have these big lump sums of cash to buy properties, mm-hmm. to be my rentals. Um, how can I go and earn bigger lump sums of right, cash? Right. Um, and that's how I discovered wholesaling because you can really, I mean, you can make 20, 30, 40 grand on one transaction. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. It seems too good to be true. Yeah, it does. Um, and I was just going to say as well, I think a lot of people would hear this and either think that that does not exist for them. Uh-huh. or that it's not possible for them. What would you say to people that were skeptical or like, you know, um, I, I think there has to be more to it. Yeah. 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 Um, I say you're right and you're wrong because you're right in like, there is more to it. It's not that easy. Um, I always say wholesaling is very simple. It is not easy. Mm. So it really is just, finding someone who's selling a house, going under contract with them at the right price, Mm -hmm. and then selling that piece of paper to somebody else and making money for it. It really is that simple. The process is not so easy. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to do the work. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of finding people, finding distressed sellers who are going to like and trust you enough to want to work with you. And for you to have the balls or boobs or whatever, the courage to go out here and do something that's brand new and to represent yourself in a way that you are a professional who knows what you're doing, even when you haven't done it before. Yeah. That is the hard part of this business. So what are some of the strategies that you started out with to find properties? Uh, Facebook, just Mm. putting myself, and I still use the exact same strategy. I teach all of my students the exact same thing. I'm like, guys, you can spend the money and a lot of people do, you can spend the money to send out postcards and to create texting campaigns where you're texting people or cold calling. You can do all that. Or you can utilize what's free, Facebook, and use it as the networking platform that it's meant to be, Mm -hmm. not just sharing funny videos all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And put yourself out there, educate people on who you are and what you do. Mm. That's what got me. My first two deals was because I put it out there on Facebook. My name's Gabrielle Simmons. I am a 
real estate problem solver. I can help you if you're facing foreclosure, if you have a distressed property, if you're tired of being a landlord, right? So just putting that out there, mm-hmm. I was able to get um, my first two deals and many deals after that uh, simply by posting. Who is an investor? Who is an investor? Mm-hmm. Like not, you're not saying names, but like who is an investor? Who is a, you know, who is somebody that you might hit up or that, you know, or, or is there's people that have surprised you that are like, Hey, I didn't, I had no idea that they wanted to invest in something like this or, um, and the investors are really hard to find. I will say that, um, typically you have to bait them with a deal. Like they don't care about who you are, what you do, what your background is. They don't care about any of that. How, how much pretty money you am are. I going to make? <laughs> yeah. How much money are, am I going to make? Yeah. Show me the ROI. A deal. Yeah. Show me the opportunity that I can buy into where I'm going to make money. Then I'll have a conversation with you. Mm. Um, so you got to have, you want to have your investors first, but because that's hard to do without giving them something, a lot of times you're starting with the deal. And so that can be very scary for people too, mm-hmm. getting into this business. So they're like, I don't want to go, I don't want to lock in a contract to buy a house and I don't have the money to buy it. Mm-hmm. This is where having a mentor, having a coach, educating yourself. Because you're signing your name on the line saying like, I'm going to buy this property in said time or somebody else will. And that property, like that's a pretty legal and binding contract. It yes. is, but well, being educated in the contract you understand that there is still an out Mm. where you will not be held liable. Okay. um, If you're not able to purchase the property. Gotcha. Gotcha. What, what do you think is one of the most hidden gems um, in this industry, in the wholesaling industry that people may not know about? What would you say is one thing that either you wish, you know, or that, you know, there's just something that like, man, Mm. I have a big, beautiful gem to share. Okay. And this is, um, Be picky in who you work with and your investors. So what most wholesalers do, um, let me, let me explain it this way. What most people would do is they would buy a bunch of products in bulk Mm -hmm. and then they would list those products, let's say on eBay. Right. Right. I think we all kind of remember eBay Mm -hmm. from back in the day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Let's say we list our products on eBay and we only want them to go to the highest bidder. That's the standard wholesale process. Mm -hmm. I get a property under contract and I put it out there, but I only put it out there to who's going to submit the highest bid. Mm -hmm. That is a mistake. So me as a wholesaler, I have done over 70 real estate transactions in three years. I've been able to do so many so quickly because I never utilized that strategy. Instead, Mm -hmm. I have found two to three reliable very key, reliable investors who I work with, who are my go-to. That's allowed me to become more educated in what they are actually looking for. So when I find a deal, I'm not guessing, I'm not putting it out there and saying like, oh man, I hope somebody buys this. And you know, um, my sale price is 230,000, but if somebody offers 260, it's theirs. Mm -hmm. No. And a lot of times I make less money per transaction Mm -hmm. than most wholesalers do because I'm not looking for the highest bidder, Mm -hmm. not every investor is an investor. Mm -hmm. Some investors are going to come in and do nothing more than waste your time. Some investors are new and they aren't super educated in the process. Scared. Mm -hmm. So they might go under contract to say they're going to buy this deal I have. And as a wholesaler, as an investor, we're typically closing in like a week. Wow. Yeah. There's not a whole lot of time, a whole lot of margin for error. Mm -hmm. New investors, the investors who may not be as educated, they might come in and offer me 40 grand more. You know, that's a big deal. But once they do some digging and they understand and they go call their hard money lender and their hard money lender explains to them all of the fees that are associated with the loan that they're going to get, they realize that they can't pay that high of a price. Now they're backing out. Now I have to go try to find another investor. Mm. So liable is key and just even though that may look better it doesn't necessarily means it is Mm -hmm. interesting so speaking of like mistakes for others and that they could make what share one notable mistake that you've made in the time that you've been in business for three years so many (laughs) <laughs> it is good to hear because, you know, there's so many people that are afraid of failure mm-hmm. and they're afraid of even trying. And especially in investments, I think that that's the biggest, 
that's the biggest reason why people don't invest is because of fear. Yeah. It's not guaranteed. Nothing is guaranteed. Nothing is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Your job that you go to work for every day is not guaranteed. Um, Let's start. My very first wholesale transaction, I did it wrong. I filled out the contract wrong. And I submitted it to the title company. That's who, like, closes the transaction. Um, And she's like, this isn't valid you like you need to redo this this and this and so i know a lot of had you already given the people the money and everything no because i don't i don't give any money oh that's right what about the other people had they already no okay yeah we (laughs) have that's scary we have to (laughs) we have to have the contract set in place and um accept it essentially by the title company before anything else happens so it was very early on but um you know, that was step one. Like I didn't know how to do the contract properly. I winged it. I was wrong. She educated me. I fixed it. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so that's one part where people will get caught up and they're just like, well, I don't know how to do the contractor. I don't know how to, yes, you should aim to be as educated as possible. Yeah. Definitely. This is not the kind of business that you want to go into blind. Mm-hmm. You do want to have somebody that you can have as a soundboard to help keep you from making costly mistakes. Mm-hmm. And you mentor. Mm-hmm. Correct. You have a program that you you mentor, which we'll we'll I'll ask you about that here in just a few because I want to make sure that we plug that. Yeah. Especially for people that are like, well, dang, now I know about this, and I know that I don't have to have a license, and I know that it's not as risky, and you know maybe they want to they want to work with you. So, what common pitfall would you advise new beginners to stay away from in wholesaling? Um. I would say like overdoing it. (laughs) Uh, Sometimes as wholesalers, we think that we have to be a savvy investor. We think that we have to understand renovation cost. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I don't know how much it's going to actually cost to replace the flooring in this whole house. Mm -hmm. You don't need to. Do a quick search online. What's the average renovation cost per square foot? for a cosmetic rehab in Colorado Springs, and Colorado. And you can just act ch- chat GPT. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you could do that. And, like, just Google it, you know, be resourceful or make a Facebook post and say, hey, does anybody know what the common renovation cost would be for a 2,000-square-foot house in mm-hmm. this area? Because mm-hmm. it is going to be area-specific. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know some wholesalers that will like go in and like hire contractors to come in and give a full scope of work. And like, that's not and necessary. You would be concerned about that because of the offer that you're making to the investor, like knowing like, Hey, I have this property. It's going for, or I don't know if you tell them, I guess you probably do tell them this is going for this amount. This is my fee. Mm-hmm. You're kind of upfront with that. The possible rehab is this amount and the potential is this amount. Yep. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Those are the three main things that we need to know. What are we going to be able to buy it for? Mm-hmm. What's the estimated renovation cost and the after repair value? So that's the number that we calculate. That's mm-hmm. very different from what realtors look at. So you had, I, I think you and I had a conversation at one point um, and we were talking about some of the West side properties or downtown properties and how they have kind of a bad rep for having bad foundations and things like that. Mm-hmm. So when you talk about, don't you don't have to know so much because you're also just the middleman it's also their due diligence the person that you're that you're selling the property to correct they still have that due diligence to check out the property to make sure that it is whatever it is that they're desiring yep um and that they can fix so when is it important then to know some of those things to be able to tell the investor because can that get a little um shady of like hey if you knew there was a foundation problem are you required to tell the investor yeah um also how much of that knowledge do you need to have to be able to tell the investor like this is you know i do you just say oh this is a um foundational fix or do you have to do due diligence as well to say like how bad is this scenario you do not um so really it's Based on your personal preference. Mm -hmm. I prefer to make my investors as knowledgeable Mm -hmm. as possible when they're going into a situation. So I might pay to get a property inspection done. Mm -hmm. And you can just, again, Google property inspector in your area. Find someone, tell them, hey, I need an inspection on this address. It's going to run anywhere from like 180 to like 250 bucks. Mm -hmm. And they will create a report and then 
Now you have a professional report that states all of the potential issues with this property. Mm -hmm. Um, If you don't want to spend the money or you don't have the money to spend to hire an inspector, it really is just based on your level of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know, you just want to communicate that to the buyer. Hey, I don't know anything more about this house than these numbers. This is what I bought it for. This is what I think it could be renovated for. This is what it should be worth after Mm -hmm. it's fixed up. Yeah. Um, It really is on them to do their due diligence, like you said, Mm -hmm. to understand if there's foundation issues. And that's the other benefit to being a wholesaler. Um, Because we're not licensed real estate agents, we aren't held to this standard of like, you know, it needing to be, um, like there's no legal, there is legal recourse. I shouldn't say there isn't any Mm -hmm. legal recourse, but we're not being governed by, uh, the National Association of Realtors or DORA or anything that says that like you must state these things. This is why it's important as a wholesaler to have a high level of integrity mm-hmm. and honesty. And right? I was going to ask because what limitations would you say are important to know knowing that you, you know now we know that you don't have to have a license, that you're not held to the same standards as a, like a real estate agent. Mm-hmm. So what limitations do you think would be important for somebody that was new getting into this to absolutely know about so they don't run afoul the law by, you know, hey, I'm not, I don't have to have a license and I'm kind of out of this and, you know, and... and you can't really. Um, mm-hmm. So long as you're honest, like don't, yeah. don't pretend to know stuff that you don't know. Mm-hmm. If you, if you don't know and you're like, hey... I see a bunch of cracks in the house and I don't know what the hell that's about. Mm -hmm. But anyways, here's the sale price, you know, then you're fine. Now, if you make a statement like I can guarantee there are no foundation issues, well, now you're getting yourself in hot water. Sure. You should never state that you know something to be a fact if Mm -hmm. you don't. Mm -hmm. Um, But otherwise, yeah, just you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. I love that. Uh, I think that makes... That would make me feel 100% more comfortable knowing that that, you know, being just very honest, having that integrity and saying, hey, I I just absolutely don't know. And not only that, your reputation. Oh, yeah. You know, if you're going to be, I mean, unless you were moving around states and just kind of here and there, if your reputation is built here in a state and you start to do bad deals, I mean, that's going to probably circulate fairly fast. Oh, yeah, it catches up real quick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What what do you wish you would have known before you got into this industry? What's one thing that you wish you would have known? Arlo, leave her alone. Um... He's just licking my leg. No. <laughs> Go, move. Stop. Go ahead. Um, something that I wish I had known before I got into this. Um, hmm. One thing that you may have found out later, or you were like, God, like, that would have saved me so much time or energy or... I would say um, understanding different strategies. So, like, wholesaling, how we've been talking about it, is very traditional Mm -hmm. is very like there's a house that needs to be flipped yeah right um had i understood creative finance strategies i would have been able to do more wholesale deals sooner uh, because there were opportunities that i passed up on i've heard that word creative financing thrown out a few different places Mm -hmm. so is this a new word that like people are starting to use all kinds or is this just something that you really do have to learn and and maybe Talk to me about creative financing. What I mean, besides you, you had said something earlier about like going out to real estate agents and saying, hey, we can actually still make money. And in my mind, I was still kind of mind blown because I was thinking if I was a real estate agent, why would I want to give up my commission Mm -hmm. to get this deal? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's not what I was referring to with creative financing. Um, Creative financing is a is an umbrella term that typically is talking about a few different strategies that fall under that umbrella. One mm-hmm. of them being buying a home subject to the existing mortgage, um, otherwise known as sub two. It's it's usually shortened up to be called sub two, the mm-hmm. sub two strategy. Um, the second one being seller financing. So if you own this house free and clear, you don't have a mortgage on it, and I come to you and say, hey, I want to buy your house. I don't need to go to a bank and get a loan to buy it. You can seller finance the house to me. So you hold a note, you become the bank, and I now am paying you every month with interest, just mm-hmm. like I would a bank, for the next 30 years. And, and you you can move into the house and have the house and everything. Mm-hmm. A little scary. A little scary. Um, actually, it's one of the best strategies really? because there's so little risk involved. Even for you as the seller of the home, 
you have a right to foreclose just like a bank does. Yeah. If I move in and I stop making payments, you foreclose on me, you get the house back. And with a seller doing something like that who has no knowledge, zero, and I'm sorry, we're jumping like that because I'm just so <laughs> like blown away. Um, so I'll, I'll make sure we go back to the actual creative financing, you know, strategies. But as a seller who knows nothing about nothing, okay, who's drawing up these contracts? Me, the investor. Mm. Um, and I've done several of these. I actually just closed on one today that I did with a seller who is an older gentleman and knew nothing about nothing. Like he said, like he knew nothing about seller financing. So you're creating these contracts for the investor though. Nope. And for, no. Well, yes, from a wholesale perspective perspective yes but in this case i bought the property myself i was okay. the investor okay okay um but usually but me, you're drawing up you don't it's not a conflict of interest that you would be the one that's buying it and drawing up the contract because it would be better on your behalf possibly no but i make sure to cover my ass by i i first of all ask the seller if it's okay for me to draw up the contracts mm -hmm. typically they say yes because they they don't know how to draw up the contracts. Mm -hmm. I draw up the contracts and then I advise them that I recommend that they consult with an attorney mm -hmm. to review the contracts if sure. there's anything that they don't understand. Due diligence again, yeah. That yeah. yeah, that's me covering my ass. That's them covering theirs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they do consult with attorneys, sometimes they don't. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah. that was number two, a uh, seller that finance. Was number two. Sorry. And then subject two is the, uh, or subject two was number one. Seller finance was number two. Uh, number three is like sandwich leasing. This is a fun one that uh, Chris Crone, he's a famous real estate guru, if you will, based out of uh, Provo, Utah. Um, he actually was my mentor. I bought mm -hmm. into his mentorship for $10,000 early in my investing um, journey, if you will. You were like, go big or go. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and that I, I gained so much knowledge from him and his programs. Um Sandwich leasing is basically you do a lease to own from a, a, a homeowner. I would go come to you and say, hey, I want to do a lease to own on mm -hmm. this property. Mm -hmm. But uh, my lease to own agreement allows me to assign that lease to own to somebody else so I can sublet. And so... Sublet, if, sublease, right? Same mm -hmm, thing? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so then I would just go do a lease to own with somebody else on the same property but for more money. Mm -hmm. And so that's one strategy to um, make money in real estate. There are so many ways. And that's what I love about. Well, and I was going to say in wholesaling, I think, or, or maybe there's another way just in real estate, which we're not getting into, but they, people always say about how you can even get invested into real estate with other people's money. Yep. Um, and that's just that creative All of financing. my properties I bought with other people's. That's not true. I made the mistake of buying some of my own properties with my own money, but I sense only by using other people's money beautiful that's a beautiful thing um so it doesn't sound like one would need too much to get started in this except for knowledge yeah that is it mm -hmm. just the knowledge you don't need money you don't need experience really you know you get started just like a realtor goes and they take a class and they learn the basics and then they call themselves realtors right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i am now a realtor i am licensed and i can go do this uh which i am not make that super clear. I am not a realtor. Um, in wholesaling, it's the same thing. Educate yourself and then you are a wholesaler. Go do wholesaler things. Mm -hmm. And then that's step one. Step two being go become an investor. As a wholesaler, you're getting first dibs on some of the greatest investment opportunities that you don't need to go pay a wholesaler to bring you these great deals. You now are getting them yourself. How many people... Well, and I guess this is really just on the investor side, but like, or maybe how many wholesalers, not even investors, would you say, eventually say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to buy it, I'm going to flip it, and then Airbnb it or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a lot of wholesalers do move into becoming the flipper. Because at that point, they're got, they're getting the knowledge on the inspections, and they're, they're learning contractors and building relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. Uh, you had mentioned a few people, this gentleman that you just spoke about, and do you know, does he still do his mentorships? Uh, yes, he does. Chris okay. Crone. Okay. And then you had mentioned a podcast earlier mm -hmm. that you listened to. Are there any other books or podcasts that um, you found valuable on your journey in all of this? Yes. Um, one of the best books is called If You Can't Wholesale After This. I don't remember who it's by. I'd have to look it up. Uh, if you can't wholesale after this, amazing book. Yeah. And 
it really is like all all of it it in its short little chapters mm-hmm. but he's going into detail like clean up your social media utilize your social media to get you deals mm-hmm. here's how to run the numbers here's how to find investors here's how to um put together a quick little thing about the property and what you think it's worth mm-hmm. it and it really is that simple wow so that's definitely a book that i recommend Let me find the author of it. While you're looking at that, I want you to give me a five-step starting path right now. Five steps that as a newbie person who wanted to get into wholesaling, Mm -hmm. you would say step one, two, three, four, and five. Step one, um, understand what wholesaling is. Mm. Okay. Um, Super important. Step two is educate yourself. You can do it for free or for cheap by using books. Podcasts, yep, YouTube, YouTube University is excellent. Um, Step three, I recommend hiring or offering value to a mentor because you are going to need it. The mentor might be your investor. Hiring or offering value. Back up on that. What what do you mean that? Offering value. So for me, for instance, if I'm a photographer and I say, hey, is it kind of like a barter deal? Is that what you're talking about? Okay. Kind of. Or, um, you know specifically talking about like working with investors. Yeah. If you want to work with an investor and you don't know anything about the investor space, just go to them and ask them like, Hey, how can I offer value? Maybe they run Airbnbs and they're like, Hey, you, you want me to coach you every day? We can sit down every day for two hours and I will teach you or not every day, once a week. And I'll teach you X, Y, Z, but I want you to clean my Airbnbs for me. Mm. Right? Like there's lots of ways we have to humble ourselves. Yep. And understand that, like, the value that we're going to get yeah. in working with experienced investors yes. is in, you cannot put a price yeah, on it's it. Yeah, it's the same way, and this is going to sound so bad, but we call, like, you know, newbie photographers who want mentorship bag bitches. <laughs> and we just say, yep, you got to hold my bag. You know what I mean? Like, you got to yeah. hold the lights, got to do this, but I'm going to give you really, really, bad. and guys, I'm, I'm kidding. It's, it is it is an industry <laughs> joke, but it's, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's like tattoo artistry, you know what I mean? You become the shop bitch. Like, you're, mm-hmm. you have to humble yourself and, and understand that the um, amount of knowledge that you are going to receive by doing that stuff as a as opposed to paying a twenty, thirty, forty, seventy thousand dollar, you know, college uh, degree or, or, or university, yeah, is so worth it. So worth it. So 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 worth it. I dedicated my first uh, roughly three years to working alongside one investor mm-hmm. and being his whatever I needed to be. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, and quickly, you know, became. Uh, a very valuable piece of the equation for them in Mm -hmm. their entire flipping operation. Mm -hmm. Um, But a lot of people had told me early on, like, why would you do that? Like, why wouldn't you just, you can go pay 20 grand and get a course that's going to teach you all of it. No, thank you. Yeah, I'm, First, I'm like, I want one-on-one. Yeah. I want to see what you're doing. I need to be there. Touch, see, hands feel. On. Yeah, yeah, I'm very, very hands-on. Okay, so let me not, let me not, let me backtrack. So which number were we just on? You said, um, for sure, you need to figure out what wholesaling is. What you is need wholesaling? to educate yourself. Educate yourself mm-hmm. and get help. So get help. Mentorship. Hire, hire a mentor or offer value to get some sort of mentorship okay. and coaching. Number four. Uh, number four is start doing it. Yeah. Like, take action. If you know, you know the steps and it's a really simple process. Again, it is simple. It's not easy. But if you know that now that you're educated, step four is to go and find a seller, Mm -hmm. get your ass out there and do it. However, by any means, if that's not, if that's door knocking, you're going and finding ugly houses and you're going up and knocking on the door and telling them, hi, I'm interested in buying your property. Mm. Um, If that's posting on Facebook, if that, whatever that is, take action, start doing it. Mm -hmm. And number five, number five, uh, follow through because Mm. you are going to get lots of no's. You have to get through the no's to get through the yeses. Mm -hmm. And that is where a lot of people give up. Yeah. They say it typically takes 10 no's to get even one. Yes. So be prepared. And some of that work is hard and vigorous, Mm -hmm. you know, going to people's houses and, and, and maybe it's even more than that in real estate at this point. It's way more than that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Cause you kind of looked at me like, "Eh, yeah, no, that would be nice. 10 no's and one. Okay. I'm down. Um, what legal and ethical considerations should wholesalers be aware of, um, to ensure that they are operating within well, first of all, maintaining the reputation, but then mm-hmm. also um, that they're able to operate within the bounds of some kind of, 
you know, structure or laws because you're not bound to this same stuff as real estate mm-hmm. agents and whatnot. Right. Um, never claim to be a real estate agent. Mm-hmm. Never claim to be a realtor. Never claim to be licensed. You Unless only know you what are. you know. You said that earlier, too. Yep. You only know what you know. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, never make promises that you can't keep, you know. But, again, this all just goes back to, like, integrity. If you are an, a person of high integrity, you're not going to do these things anyways. Mm-hmm. Don't lie. Don't say that you can do things that you can't do. Don't claim to be something you're not. Mm-hmm. Don't claim to know what you don't know. Um, that really covers all the bases of how to keep yourself out of legal trouble. Mm-hmm. Also, again, going back to contracts. You now are writing up contracts. You're doing things in a way that they are legally binding. Have somebody in your corner. Have somebody who's going to review that contract Mm -hmm. for you. You need some kind of coach, mentor, investor, somebody who cares who's going to make sure that you're not putting yourself in a situation through that contract. Does your mentorship offer all of those things? Mm -hmm. Nice. Wonderful. I don't offer the complete mentorship to like anyone. Mm-hmm. There is a, an application process um, because I'm very, very picky with who I work with. Yeah. I have had a lot of people come in and waste my time. Yeah. And that I simply refuse yeah. um, to do it anymore. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, for full mentorship, for me to be like super in- hands on, we're going to have like weekly meetings for hours on end and like you're getting all the things. Um, and access to, you know, my phone number to call me, text me whenever you want. That's um, Mm $7,000 up front, non-refundable. And again, you have to, they have to be able to pass the application. They have, I have to know that they're going to come in and they're going to get shit done. Yeah. God, well, who would want to waste $7,000? I mean, I I know that it happens more so than not. People will commit to something like that because they feel that that's going to make them do what they're supposed to do and then they still don't do it. Nope interesting it doesn't guarantee success yeah oof girl just dropped a damn gem <laughs> um talk to me about the form uh cr10100 which is the sales tax wage withholding like do you know anything about that and like how this affects your li- so okay l- let me just back up then when you're making this money mm-hmm. what kind of taxable you know, it's all uh, taxable income. And is it just employment, self-employment income? Is uh-huh. it is it considered something else? Yeah. So um, you want to do your wholesaling business under an LLC. Okay. Um, first and foremost, you don't want to do any transaction, sign any contract with your name. It is always your LLC. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is self-employed income. Mm-hmm. And now I uh, do recommend structuring your LLC to be an S corp. You can pay yourself. So that you can pay yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that's, you know, essentially a write-off from the company. And then you're just paying your taxes on the money that you earned as an individual. And then you're still writing off all kinds of stuff. Like your gas. You can write off your car note. Mm -hmm. You know, what you pay for your car, your gas. Especially because you're going to these properties, checking them out, multiple meetings. Yes, you can write off all of it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um. So really then it doesn't, there's no like type of different, uh, I mean, I guess it can put you in different tax brackets uh, depending on how much you make, but really there's nothing that's kind of hidden within there. Like, you know, doing running Airbnbs and stuff, you find a lot of hidden Mm -hmm. tax things that, Mm -hmm. oh, okay, well, you're going to get dinged on this and this and that. Do you have a special account uh, person that you use specifically Mm -hmm. for? Yeah. (laughs) That I'm laughing because I didn't, I I did. I had an accountant accountant from day one. Again, I started my first business when I was 23. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. So I made the mistake of hiring an accountant and not having any of the knowledge myself at all. I mean, truly, I didn't know how to run a business. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the difference between an S Corp, LLC, sole proprietor, partnership. I had, I knew none of it. Mm -hmm. I hired an accountant and paid them lots of money to do it all, to manage it all. And trust. And I, I highly recommend that no one ever does (laughs) that because I have been so very screwed. Mm -hmm. Um, Still dealing with that and a potential loss. And you know, I had no idea that when you do that, you're still at fault because Uh there's still that due diligence of who you hired and that, you Mm -hmm. know, which is insane to me because you're hiring them because you don't know. Because Exactly. (laughs) And so you're trusting that. Yeah. Yes. Um, Okay. So you kind of already talked to me about how, how to find investors, um, tax brackets and all of that stuff. Um, I guess a couple of my last questions would be, um, what would you say the disadvantages or hardship in wholesaling is? 
There are no disadvantages. Mm, how did I know you were going to say that when I was writing this question? <laughs> I was like writing it and I was like, she's going to be like, there's no. So I was like, let me, let me, let me expound or hardships. <laughs> uh, hardships in wholesaling. Really just having grit, you know, mm. um, you got to be a tough cookie. Mm -hmm. You cannot, you cannot take no's as losses. Mm -hmm. You didn't lose anything. She didn't have it to begin with. Yeah. Um, and understand that people, the people that you are working with as a wholesaler. Oh, I really, I really am glad you asked that question because this is super important. The people that you're working with as a wholesaler are people who are in distress situations. Mm -hmm. So you have to lead with your heart. Mm. This is not a money driven business. As much as there is a shit ton of money to be made, this is about love. This is about compassion. This is about helping people. Mm -hmm. um, that can be one of the hardest things because you will see things that will break your heart. I've seen things like where I go into a house and I see a kid's bedroom with nothing but dog shit and piss everywhere. Mm. And, you know, it's, a, it's an infant, you know, mm. kind of situation. There's a lot of things that you have to be emotionally prepared to deal with. Mm -hmm. And remove yourself from too, because then, I mean, God, you're talking about, you're not a social worker and yet right. you kind of like, oh, that would be so concerning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the, that's the hardest part is um, feeling the weight. It's almost like being a, a detective or something mm -hmm. like sometimes you're feeling the way you're dealing with people who their dad just died in the house that you're looking to go by, yeah. you know, and the bed that he died in is still right there in the room. Um, they're crying, you know, it might be a divorce situation. They're fighting in front of you. I cannot tell you how many crazy stories I have of those kinds of situations. Um, so just understanding that there are going to be emotional hardships that you have to be tough and willing to push through. Wow. Miss G, Miss Investment Lady. Um, <laughs> investor Lady. Investor Lady. Th tell everybody where they can find you at. Uh, Instagram, you can find me at uh, Investor Lady G slash Trucker Lady G. Uh, you know, I'm starting my trucking company again, mm -hmm. so I'm going to be, like, posting for both of those. Um, Facebook, Gabrielle Simmons. Uh, there's a few other people with my name, but you'll know it's me because I have, like, uh, my cover photo is me with, like, a big pink cape and, and your beautiful hair that's always different colors <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i love it i don't have this <laughs> i love it okay and your mentorship program there is an application that they would have to fill out if they are very very interested and um are serious about business you can fill out her applicant form and see if you can get approved to get started in something like this so mm -hmm. um, otherwise i do offer courses okay. um online pre-recorded courses that i've put together youtube channel um, I do have a YouTube channel and it is also Investor Lady G. Okay. Yep. Um, the courses can be found on my website, gabrielle-simmons.com. Uh, yeah, I think that covers all the things. Well, thank you so much for gracing us with all of your knowledge. I am like, so, um, just you're remarkable. Your knowledge you. is remarkable. Um, the age that you are like, I wish that I had it going on at that age. I'd probably be 10 times more where I am today <laughs> if I had started that early. And um, so, I mean, wow, girl, just keep it up. And um, I, I just feel like I want to put you in my pocket and like keep <laughs> you there. <laughs> so, you guys, that's it for this episode. Um, please like, please comment, please share. Um, and you know how to get hold of um, uh, of us. Um let us know what you guys want to hear about. Let us know if you have any questions. Um, we'll put all of the ways to um, reach Gabrielle inside of the comments as well. Um, and we'll see you next time. That's it. <laughs>